Community Church, where we're connecting all generations to Jesus. Whether you're here with us live or you're part of our live stream audience, we are so thankful to spend our Sunday morning here with you. Before we get started with our worship, please hear this call to worship from Psalms chapter 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is a man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him lower than the heavens, be, heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honor. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Would you please stand and join us as we begin our worship service this morning? Yeah. 
God, we thank you for this gathering that we share and the voices that are lifted here. And we pray that all of that has been uh, just pleasing in your sight, Lord. Would you come and move in our hearts that we might follow hard after you and trust you fully in every way that you move. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Please be seated. Kids, come on forward for our kids' time. Well, as our kids come down, a couple things I want to mention. As you can see, we are celebrating 150 years uh, as Rockland and... Um, uh, this is not a season of patting ourselves on the back. This is celebrating God and his faithfulness in having this church here and the disciples that have been made over 150 years. And so we're going to be having a blast. We're going to be doing a lot. Um, later on in August, we're going to have some of our former pastors come back and be a part of our services and uh, a big picnic on the, on the uh, 24th. I believe it is. Uh, we've got a big picnic coming up. All this is in your bulletin to celebrate these kinds of things about God and his goodness and his faithfulness for 150 years here to Rockland. Um, a couple things I want to mention, and kids, you got to see this too. There's some flowers up there. Um, flowers on the altar. We've got two today. Pastor Paul and his wife Sandy are celebrating their 45th wedding anniversary. 45th wedding anniversary. And uh, they were here during our early hour, but the other flowers are for Jerry and Mary Parker, who are celebrating their 61st wedding anniversary. <laughs> Pretty awesome. So we're thrilled. Well, it's good to see you kids. I'm going to pray for you, and then we'll send you on down to your classes. So uh, we'll pray together, and then um, we'll say the Lord's Prayer together, and it'll come up on the screen if you need to um, take a peek at that as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these um, young people that are here today. We pray for blessings on them. We pray that you, even today, through their leaders, God, and through your word, you just do powerful works in their lives, that they would just, even at a young age, be stirred to know you and to love you deeply. Thank you for the, the teachers that you've put in their, in their way to uh, be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them, and we pray blessings on them uh, in this time this morning. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, you guys can head right on out. Um, we'll continue to worship through giving. Um, this, uh, this whole month, our dollar bill recipient is uh, a ministry called Clear Creek Rock House. 
This is a uh, awesome, awesome ministry that's like 13 minutes. I clocked it once. It's right down like Idaho Springs area from here. And um, they, they work with teenagers especially that um, many of them come from, through no fault of their own, are in some really difficult homes difficult parents, difficult family situations, and they have mentors that come alongside tutor these kids. Many of them are li labeled by Jeffco at, at risk or at uh, Clear Creek County by at risk, and um, these mentors come in, they share the gospel with them, they help them graduate. It's, it's a fantastic ministry, and so we're privileged to get to partner um, with them, and there's a bunch of people here that are mentors already and already are participating in the ministry, and this is just another way we can participate. Every $1 bill that goes in, we match it from our budget, goes right out the door to uh, this awesome ministry, Clear Creek Rock House in Idaho Springs. Um, so we'll continue now to worship through giving. <laughs> tells the sun to rise every morning, colors the sky with the shades of his glory, wakes us with mercy and love, Jesus does. Who holds the orphan, comforts the widow, Christ will Every sorrow carries the pain of his children, Jesus does.
prepare our hearts for the reading of God's word. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. And when Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am always with you to the end of the age. The word of the Lord. Well, I'm so glad to be back. If you're a guest, my name's Jim. I get to be the lead pastor here. And um, I, uh, I want to tell you, I love you. I love this church. Uh, I miss you. Uh, I am so excited to be back. And I want to, today, um, th- this is really an act of love, what I want to do, which is this. Um, there is a text in the Bible, and you just heard it read, that if you've been a Christian for a while, you might know this text, and you know its importance and things like that. Um, but this is one of those texts that for some reason, uh, that I'll go into, um, a lot of Christians kind of go, that's a great idea, I just don't think it's for me. I just don't think I can actually be faithful and obedient to what that is saying. It's this like impossible ideal sort of thing, like a bucket over here, like when we read, you know, do not worry ever, and the Bible says that, and you're like, ooh, and it just feels like, well, that just feels impossible. Uh, do everything without complaining. Do everything without arguing right? You start to see some of those, be holy as I am holy, and start to go, oh my goodness. And, and with this one, when we see the Great Commission, as it's sometimes called, to make disciples, there's a lot of Christians that, that my experience has been, they kind of go, that sounds really great. I hope somebody else does that. I just don't know how to be a part. And so today, I'm, we're going to spend a bunch of time just being insanely practical about figuring out how do we take this ever important text, the Great Commission, and actually make it doable in our lives. Because if, and maybe if you don't know, this is a, this is a text that um, is really um, uh, uh, the, the key mandate for the global church of Jesus Christ. This is every local church everywhere in the world is somehow about making disciples. That's what the church is about, is about making disciples. If you cease to say we will make disciples, then you're not really, you're, you might be doing some other Christian things or some other good things, but you're not being a church if you're not about making disciples. This is the, the charge to the local church, and this is also the charge to the Christian, that individuals, as Christians, our role is to make disciples. And so what Jesus said a couple thousand years ago to those guys on that hill to say, make disciples of all nations has taken and it, has, it is working. It is, the gospel of Jesus has gone the world over now for a couple thousand years. And I'm afraid people sometimes go, that sounds really great. I just don't know my part. Maybe because it says make disciples of all nations. And we kind of go, yeah, right, make disciples of all nations. I'm supposed to go to every single nation and every single person and make a disciple out of them. And it, really what it's calling us to do is to just say, you should be a part of the global mission of God. Like, imagine being there that day, those disciples that Jesus is speaking this to, and he says, go and make disciples. And they're going, okay, I can handle that. And then he says, of all nations. And I bet their eyes got really big. Like, are you kidding me? Somebody tell him that uh, airplanes haven't been invented yet. Tell him that there's no cars, that there's no internet. How in the world are we supposed to go from this little hill with our, like, sandals and zero technology and go take it to all the nations? And really what he's charging them to do is to say, in, y- in your lifetime, be a part of the global mission of God as you can. And there's faithful Christians over here that are doing it, and here, 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 all over the place, and that's how this mission goes global. But I think maybe even one of the bigger disconnects is when you see make disciples, it sort of feels like that's kind of a churchy word, and that sort of feels like, well, maybe Jim can make a disciple, or maybe some pastor, or maybe somebody who like knows the Bible better than I do, maybe they could make uh, a disciple if they, if they have been a Christian for a long time. I, we go to a family camp every summer, and um, years ago, one of the, the moms came up to me, and she said, she goes, because um, uh, she, she has this idea, there's certain things only pastors are allowed to do. And she goes, um, our daughter, who's probably 12, our daughter said she wants to be baptized. 
And she just looked at me with this big smile, and I said, that's great. And she didn't know what to do, so she goes, like that. So, so like, do something with that to me. And I said, I said, well, okay, let's talk. We just talked and talked and talked. And I said, you know, how can I help? And we went through it. And, um, and the, the short version was, and I, I, we're baptizing next week. I'm baptizing at least a couple people. Um, and so I baptize, but I also want to just make sure that people understand that's not your only option. And she kind of had, I think, this idea like, well, the pastor has like special magic holy hands or something that he baptizes with, and so um, he better do it. And so they were like, well, I think, I think she would prefer that a pastor does it. And I don't know much about 12-year-old girls, but I was like, I don't know that she prefers that. My guess is you prefer that. And I said, if she prefers that, how about if we ask her? And the dad looked at me like, well played, well played, because he knows what's going to happen is I'm going to ask her, and she's going to go, do you want this weirdo that you don't really know or dad to baptize you? And she was like, dad, so dad did it. Um, but I remember he, he was joking with me. We were walking off, and he goes, well, we asked you to do it. And I, and I said, tell me, just tell me why. I was just interested in, the ba- in his background. And this was his line. He said, well, we kind of figure you're a professional baptizer. <laughs> Isn't that a great line? I like that. I need business cards that say professional baptizer for hire, Jim Gribnitz. That's what I do. So, but they did. They just sort of had this like, they, they had this like, well, that's something you have to do. So the, the end of the story is I, I sat there, and I, I talked and shared and shared and shared. But at the end of the day, the dad Um, you know, baptized his daughter in this river and then picked her up and just sat there like this and everybody's crying. It was, it was phenomenal to see what the Lord had done, but it it was, it was kind of that spot of, well, this is a big deal. And so therefore I need to pass it off to someone else. And all I wanted to make sure they knew was you can do the big stuff too. I'm here to help. I'm not here to replace you. I'm here to come alongside you. If helping looks like me doing something or saying something or writing something or responding, that's fine. But my job is not to replace you. My job is to come alongside you. In fact, I, you know, I, I would say this. Um, there are certain people, like think if someone is not a Christian, who do they want to hear the gospel from and see it lived out more? A guy who for his living does something that they don't really even believe in yet. Oh, you're a pastor, so you sit up there at the church. Well, you don't sound interested. Like, I don't want to sit and talk to you because you're going to talk about work, and I know nothing about it. You'll probably talk about faith and stuff, and I'm not really there. And so for, for them to see me and my example is fine, I've got a role in that. But think about this, that if they go, oh, you're just like me. You, you've got, you're married, you've got kids, you're, or you're single, or you're whatever. You're at this stage in life, you're trying to figure out, oh, this new thing that's impacting our property taxes. You've got, um, you've got a job, you've got, you're thinking about all these things in the future. There's some similarities in our life, but wait a minute, you're doing it and you're walking with Jesus. There's something different about how you're doing it. Which one do you think is a better connection? Just practically speaking, You have a ministry that is incredibly difficult for me to have. That's why the mandate is not Jim and other like clergy people, which isn't even the Bible, to say you go make disciples. It is everybody, followers of Jesus Christ, make disciples. So I want to take this and let's make it doable today. Because you might, you might be wondering, when you look at this whole text, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. There's a lot in there. Why are we saying make disciples, make disciples, make disciples? Okay, let me just, we'll peek under the hood real quick at the grammar in Greek, and then I promise we'll get out of there real quick, okay? There's four words in this that are commands. There's four words in this that are commands, and you can see them. Go, make, baptizing, and teaching. Go make baptizing and teaching. If you could see the underlying Greek grammar, you would see that those four are clumped together as imperatives or commands in the text. One of them is in a slightly different part of speech, and then the other three are in the same part of speech. The one that's unique, that is actually an imperative, is the the type of word that it is, um, is the part of speech, is make disciples. The three others that are also commands, but they're technically participles, meaning they end in I-N-G, are go, baptize, and teach. In other words, there is one major command in this entire thing, and it is to make disciples. The other three commands are ways that you fulfill that big command by going, by baptizing, and by teaching. All right? So that's why. Make disciples, and then the really cool thing is here's three ways to do it. And because, listen, because this is something that is for every single church, 
all the application today, I'm going to show you ways that you can actually take this and you can step into it here at Rockland, or we have people visiting. You can do this back at your home church, similar, um, that you can immediately in this fall. <laughs> what was that? I was going to just talk over it, but I'm, well, I'm just going to roll through it here. I don't know what the, Okay. All the application today, because we're about making disciples, and all the application is about becoming a disciple and making disciples, I'm going to show you tons of ways that you can get involved in this right here um, at Rockland. So um, here is the the overall statement that I want to leave you with. I'm going to start with it, and then we'll come back to it at the end. And here's what the text is saying, that our job as Christians is to make big and small disciples in big and small ways. Make big and small disciples in big and small ways. Big and small, meaning all the way from the nursery to the oldest person among us. I'm, I'm actually meaning this to be um, no matter your life stage, no matter how, how much or little money that you have, to make disciples, big and small, anybody and everybody, and then in big and small ways. We make big and small disciples in big and small ways ways. So a couple things to mention. Um, First of all, before we talk about making disciples, we should say, what does that even mean? What's a disciple? Well, the disciples in Jesus's day, they had a phrase that they would use that they would say, if you are a disciple, you are a learner or you are a follower. And they would say that you are walking, quote, in the dust of the rabbi. So you would have a rabbi, a teacher that was leading, and then your job was literally to follow that teacher and watch what he does, observe his life, ask him questions, and you would walk behind him. So the picture is, as we are disciples, we are walking in the dust of Jesus. We are followers of Jesus Christ. And the idea is you look around to make disciples and you say, come do this with me. Come follow Jesus with me, and you're walking together. Which means if you want to make disciples... The first thing you have to do is you have to be a growing disciple of Jesus yourself. That's what we do. <clears throat> I got, um, so I was at a church one time and they, we brought in, um, I didn't, but somebody brought in a, like a marketing firm to help us with our mission statement. And the pastor heard about it and just was like, we brought a marketing firm. And they paid some marketing firm a lot of money. And he was kind of frustrated by it. And it didn't feel real spiritual to him. And so they were asking him, like, okay, what's our mission statement of the church? What's the mission? And they were going to do listening. I think they did do, like, listening groups and all sorts of stuff. And the pastor was there, and he was getting frustrated. I actually got to see this. And he said, um, he said honestly, uh, they were asking him, like, you seem frustrated. He said, honestly, I just want to be about helping people follow Jesus. This was day one of the marketing firm being there, and they went, oh, helping people follow Jesus. That's good. We'll circle back to that. And like a month later and thousands of dollars later, the mission of the church was helping people follow Jesus. I think it's about the simplest way that I can think of to say this is what we're about, to help people follow Jesus. We've got to do it on our own first. I have goals uh, from the elders every year from our board here. Do you know what the number one goal at the very top of the entire thing is? If you have a a friend that's a pastor, go ask them if they have any goals like this. This is the number one goal that I am held accountable for. Here it is. To be formed into the growing disciple that we long to make. To be formed into the growing disciple that we long to make. I will never be able to say, you guys should really be followers of Jesus if I'm not doing it first. And so the very first thing is be the follower of Jesus Christ that Jesus wants us to make here at Rockland. So how how do you do this? How do you actually personally grow as a disciple? I'm going to start throwing some things out because this is what we are about. So like this fall, for example, we have tons of Bible studies that are coming up. Bible studies are a way you can learn about God. Uh, You can learn about his son, Jesus Christ, learn about what he's done, feel secure in your faith. You can meet other people that are secure in their faith, and you can grow together. We've got um, tons of Bible studies. Life groups meet as well. Um, We're looking this fall at doing a parent equipping thing for a few nights as well, all to say, here's how you can can become a disciple and make disciples uh, of your children. We have CBS that meets here, Community Bible Study. I love CBS. Whenever I get to go and I get to talk to them, I always say, it sounds so strange to say, I love that you keep teaching the Bible. I love that you come back to the Bible. There's a women's one that meets here on Wednesday. There's other ones in the community. I'm going fast because this is all in your bulletin and on our website and things like that. Um, We've got, if we're going to be disciples, we need to see the world how God sees it and understand a Christian worldview. And uh, many people that I've been talking to are looking around, I'm wondering the same, are looking and going, 
the school system today seems different, for those of us that are adults, than when I was going through the schools. It seems very different. How is it different? Why is it different? Um, and what can we do about it? And so we've got something coming up in October, uh, Rockland Talks. We're bringing in the president of CCU, uh, Dr. Don Sweeting, who has thought deeply about this. And he's a good, godly, wise man. And he's going to talk about what's happening. What happened in the, in the like, elementary schools, middle school and high school, and what's happening now in college education. This completely changes the world that we're in, how people are being formed in their schools. There's all sorts of opportunities for this. My wife has a Bible study that meets right across the street. Um, it is knowing God by name, going through the names of God. And it's a community of moms that get together every other Tuesday and they study the Lord and they're checking in with each other to spur one another on. Um, I've got two Bible studies that I lead. Um, this year we're going through the Gospel of John. Um, and um, it starts, I said it wrong last hour, uh, it starts not this week or next week, but the week after. Whatever's in your bulletin is right. Um, these studies are intentionally designed. There's a men's one at 7 a.m. on Tuesdays, and the women are um, Wednesdays at 9. They're intentionally designed where if you're going, I'm traveling a bunch, I, can't, I, I try to find something I can sort of pop into, you can do that. At the same time, we have people in that room that are there all the time. We have people that... Um, you know, if I say Gospel of John, there would be some people that would go, I could teach that if you need me to just get up and teach it for you because they've studied it. And then there's other people that when I say open to the Gospel of John, they're going to go, where is the Gospel of John? It is for anybody and everybody to come. And the idea is to become a disciple of Jesus Christ and to take that next step. And so I just want to put a challenge out that if you're hesitant, I don't know if I want to get into something because what if we move in a year or something like that? Just get going and become a disciple of Jesus Christ and grow in him so you can make disciples. So that's the big mandate. Make disciples. How do we do it? By going, by baptizing, and by teaching. And it says, when it says go right here, I said it was a participle. It actually, like the, I, I think the best way to translate it that would make sense would be to, to pretend Jesus said, go, and as you are going, make disciples. Really what he's saying is, you know how you make disciples? You realize that you are 24-7. That's your job. Your job is not your job. Your job is making disciples. That's our job, 24-7. As you are going. It doesn't discriminate. Life stage, age, how much money you have, what language you speak, anything like that. This gospel has just blown across cultures, and our job is to bring it to them as we are going. This is every day. As you're going across the room to talk to your kids or your grandkids, make disciples. As you're logging on to that Zoom call to talk about something, make disciples. As you're going to the doctor, make disciples. As you're about to send that text message, just wait a second and think about making disciples. As you're responding to that person who said something really unkind, make disciples. As you're going on a date, as you're going to the gym, as you're going to the grocery store, make disciples. We have students here. Students. In school, you're a missionary. That's your job. As you are going to class, make disciples. As you are going to your theater rehearsal, make disciples. As you are going, make disciples. And all of a sudden, we can take all these little mundane things in life and we can redeem them and use them for the glory of God and the good of others. We make disciples. Let me pause. If Jesus was here today talking to you as an individual... What would Jesus say? As you are blank, make disciples. As you are going, make disciples. The next two things, he says, baptizing and teaching. And these two, I think, go together. And here's, here's one of the ways that they're linked many ways. Here's one of the ways that they're linked. Um, when you think of, of baptizing, like you'll see next week, we're going to baptize people. We're celebrating that they have come, they have gone from death to life. They, they, are, uh, they are new creatures in Christ. They have trusted in him. And so we're celebrating that. And when you think of baptism, you can kind of think of that as also representative of sort of the big things. 
big movements, big decisions, big things that happen in our life for the Lord, and then teaching someone to obey, oftentimes that is the, I'm walking alongside you, and you're, you're, you're watching me interact with my wife and learning how to interact with your wife kind of stuff. Or maybe it's just casual conversation where maybe some nuggets get thrown back and forth, you know, nuggets of wisdom. So you've got the big things and the small things. That's why I'm saying make big and small disciples in big and small ways. And so when it says um, baptism, and it, we think about big things that we get to be, an opportun- we have the opportunity to be a part of. We do this family camp every year. I am well aware that people come to that camp pulled out of their everyday life. Phones don't work very well there. It's glorious. And there is just something that hearts are just ready to be spoken to very directly. And so we take every advantage of it to just go, I think God might want to do something big. So I, I press maybe a little more that week, even than other weeks. But we have the opportunity to be, to be part of these big moments in people's lives. Do big, big things for the Lord. Now, some people think like this. There's a, a couple that used to go to Rockland, uh, the Whittlesees. Um, Rick and Carrie and then um, Toller and Logan are the kids. They, um, they don't go here anymore because they moved to Asia. So they're not here. Um, and they are missionaries. They um, uprooted their family. They said, we want to do something for the Lord. We feel that calling to do it. And he emailed me and said, the big prayer request right now is they are trying to smuggle 20,000 Bibles into Burma. He said, pray the printing all comes out correctly. We were able to get them distributed inside Burma despite heavy fighting in so many areas and other logistical and weather roadblocks like rainy season that makes mountainous dirt roads often impassable. The people are so hungry for these Bibles, as most poor families own no Bible. Often the pastor is the only one in these remote small villages that owns a Bible. And so I'd be remiss if I just blew past this to go, there might be somebody here that God is calling to say, chuck it all, move to Burma and do something like this. He does that. And if that's you, can I encourage you to be bold and to take the next faithful step to explore that? Some people, that's who God is going to call. Big ways. Go do big things. Some might need to have a conversation about leaving their job and going into full-time vocational ministry in a church or a local ministry. Some might need to think about a big thing of going, I will do it. I will go minister to teenagers. I know some people are terrified of having conversations with teenagers. It is like its own subculture because the generations, there's quite the gap between it. But to say, I will step out in faith and take a risk and do this big thing and say, I'm going to commit and I'm going to dig in and mentor them. I mentioned um, Clear Creek Rock House earlier um, is a great ministry here. We have several people here that are mentors that have worked there. They've got a table after the service. You can actually go um, and, uh, and meet, some of the, meet some of the people that are there. Um, I mentioned that the, the, these minister to, ch- to teenagers that are um, to varying degrees in really rough situations. Kids that have, um, their, their future to the world has kind of just been written. And uh, this Christian ministry steps in, and many of them finish high school, even go to college, quit drinking, quit having sex, quit some of these big things that are happening. These mentors get to step in and get to be a part of their life to help shape them and help them make big decisions. They uh, came once. They, they were hesitant to come because the guy said he didn't have the right church clothes. And his mentor assured him, absolutely nobody cares, please come. And they came to church, and these three teenage boys came here, and then they went afterwards. We have a class that meets during this service. They came to the first service, and they went downstairs. Let me just say, they're the only teenagers that were in that class. Other than that, um, the median age is probably like, oh gosh, I don't want to say. It's older people. We'll just say that. Sorry. I just realized what I was about to step into there. Uh, It's older. And there would be no place else in the world where three teenage boys who don't have a clue what's happening here at the church, would just walk in, not look the part, be fully embraced, be able to sit around, and they said it was a blast, and everybody loved having them. That's the church. We make big and small disciples in big and small ways. Clear Creek is a great way to do that. And then you think about um, teaching people to obey. These are really like the little moments that we have in life. These are the moments that you have that somebody says, can we go get lunch? 
and you're going, I really don't want to go get lunch today. And you go and get lunch and you try to speak life to them and help them. That may end up meaning the world to them. This is why it's important to be a part of a local church. Because, if the, listen, if the mission of the church is to bring the gospel to the nations, now all of a sudden, any part that you have in that is a part of the greater mission to bring the gospel to the nations. I talked to somebody, uh, you know, we do donuts and coffee um, between services, and uh, I talked to a woman who said, who, you know, basically made it sound like, I mean, I can do donuts and coffee if you want, that's easy. And I said, well, that's really nice, but it made it sound like she thought it was very unimportant. So I said, hang on just a minute. Let me just tell you about donuts and coffee. The reason we do donuts and coffee is not because they're healthy, not because anything like that. It's really just, do you know how many conversations can happen in there? Do you know how many times I've just walked through and two people are talking and I hear the conversation that goes something like, oh, you've got a Bible study. That's, is, is that a Bible study anybody can kind of go to? And all of a sudden, you just created a forum where people can go in there and visit and connect and go deeper into discipleship. They moved, so they're not here anymore, but she was like, oh, my goodness. And you couldn't, have, you couldn't drag her away from serving coffee and donuts. And all of a sudden, that thing she did, she felt such a tie to the gospel mission of the church. So I don't do this very often. Um, I, I, if you can grab in your bulletin, there was an insert in there. I want to show you this. Um, this, is, this is the attempt to answer the question. People come and ask me when they're about getting engaged and serving, um, how can I help? What do you need? And I generally don't answer that question because I want to find out, tell me about you, tell me about your gifts. Let me get to know you a little bit more. And, uh, and then I'm finding out that some people go, my gift and what I love, what brings me joy is to find out where the needs are and meeting those needs. And so what I want you to see, I just asked several different groups, what are, the, what are the big needs right now at Rockland that if someone wanted to step into it, here's what they could do. So let me just very quickly go through these with you. One is our greeting ministry. Um, this is if anybody just thinks, hey, all I'm doing is standing there and smiling and opening a door for people. Um, when I was off in July, I went to a few different churches completely different experience if you walk in and no one pays attention to you or if somebody just says, hi, smiles, we're glad you're here. This is the first impression that people have of this community of faith. Coffee and donut servers is another one. I mentioned that one there. All the ways you can get involved and the ways you can contact people are all in here. On the back, communion servers, that's one that people go, well, you're a professional communion server. It's not. This is, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are qualified to come to a service like this, be on the communion serving list, and to be up here and to serve communion, and you get to remind people week in, week out, the body of Jesus Christ for you, the blood of Jesus Christ for you. Nursery and children's ministry volunteers. Um, there's a lot of different opportunities there. Um, I'm going to talk more about that next week. But let me just say what a, what a joyful, rewarding thing to be able to sit down with a kid, to either hold a kid in the nursery, to anything along the way to just speak the truth of the good news of Jesus Christ to them. And lastly, security team may sound like a strange one. Um, but what they tell us is uh, we, have a, you know, we have the deputy here and then we've got people here that are working security. If someone's going to do something bad on a Sunday morning, they will drive by and see that we have a deputy and the number, that's the number one way to prevent something. People will see that and assume that we've got security people and go on to someplace else. So this is a group of people that can feel like my ministry of sitting in here and just sort of checking things out and just being here week in, week out and just my presence here helps enable the safety of the people so that they can worship God. You see how all these different things are tied together to the gospel mission when you're a part of a local church. This is why I, I will say, biblically, this is one of many reasons you and I are supposed to be a part of a local church. We're going to be having some people um, join the church here in a few weeks. Um, we've got a Come and Consider class on August 18th about joining the church. If anybody is interested in doing that, we'd be glad to talk to you about that. Um, but... I want to remind you, make big and small disciples in big and small ways. And here's why. is because the small thing that you do might be a big thing for somebody else. The small thing that you do might be the big thing for somebody else. Three quick stories. I was um, probably 15 or 16 years old. I was with my youth group. We were somewhere, I don't even know where. And one of our volunteers was there. 
And all, I say all the kids, there was a group of kids that we were ready to leave. And we asked the person, the youth pastor, and he was like, no, we're going to stay for a little bit. And we were like, all right. So we went to, one, we ganged up on one of the volunteers. And we said, we're all ready to leave. And it was there maybe three guys and three girls in high school. And we all went up to this one leader. And we just said, hey, we're kind of bored. We're ready to leave. Can we, you know, can you, can you help us out? And then one of the guys said, his name's Kyle. He said, Kyle, do you want to leave? He asked the adult, do you want to leave? And the adult knew exactly what was going on, that we were going around the system and going to him. And he said to the six of us on that day, he goes, uh, you see that woman over there? And we said, yeah, it was his wife. I said, yeah. And he goes, uh, I just want to be wherever she is. And she's going to be here. So I want to be here. And the three girls all go, oh, like that. They did it in unison. The guys kind of did a, oh, lame, you know, kind of made fun of him or something like that. Except for me. Because I was at a season in my life where my parents' marriage wasn't going so well. And when I got to see that, the standard for the woman that I was going to marry someday shot through the roof. Second example. I was a counselor. I was probably 19 or so at this point. <clears throat> and um, the main job of the counselor, they, they kind of promoted me unexpectedly, and I got in this role like a senior counselor. And the main job of this counselor at this summer camp was to teach Bible studies. And they were like, oh, yeah, you're going to be great at teaching Bible studies and stuff. I said, oh, yeah, it's good, thanks. And then I didn't tell them I had never led a Bible study in my life. But I talked a big game like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'll be great. I'm sure I'll be great, great you know. <clears throat> and so I found the guy who was like head over all the camp named Dan. I walked with Dan, and I was trying to find a real subtle way to go, how do you lead a Bible study? Which I didn't, couldn't say it like that because that's my main role. And so I just kind of threw it out questions like, um, like, hey, do you have any just kind of tips to make it even better or something like that? Like I was just trying to, I was fishing, but I was really like, I don't even know what I'm doing. And, um, and so he did the thing where he would go, well, what do you think? You know, you've been a part of Bible studies. What's been good and helpful for you? And I sort of threw some stuff out, and we dialogued a little bit, and I was still just like, I'm not sure what to do. And then I said, okay, thanks very much, thanks very much. And then I was about to turn and go, and he goes, Jim, let me tell you one thing. He goes, if you are going to lead a Bible study, use the Bible. <laughs> and I sort of thought, yeah. And he looked at me, and he's this, this wise old man, and he looked at me with this big smile on his face, and he just goes, that's where the magic is. And my esteem of the word of God went from here to here instantly. Third story. <clears throat> I was at a, a church, the one that brought in the consultants and everything from earlier. Uh, I was at that church, and I was the middle school pastor, and there was a youth pastor who also did a lot of the preaching. And he left to go be a lead pastor at another church. And so there was a big preaching gap. I've never preached before in my life. I went to this big old church that they bring in like the biggest, best speakers and people out of town and stuff. And I went into the, the lead pastor and I just sort of sheepishly just sort of went, um, hey, if you kind of need anybody to preach with him being gone or anything, you know, I mean, I'm happy to sort of help. There's like, you know, 12 other pastors on staff, probably all of them more qualified. And I, I just sort of sheepishly went in and just said, hey, I'm willing. And then I just sort of, Tuck tail, and I, and I left. That day, it was the same day, a few hours later, he sent out the preaching schedule for the upcoming couple months, and my name was on it. My buddies who worked there kept coming by my office and going. <laughs> he never heard me preach. He couldn't have. He said, let's give this guy a shot. I got up to preach. I had like eight weeks to prep. It was Philippians 4. I could probably almost give you the sermon. Philippians 4, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And I, by the time I got up to give it, I'd done it so much, I didn't even need any notes. And I, I did it, and I got done, and Nikki came up, and, I, just, and I, I gave her a big hug, and then I pulled her back like this, and I just said, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Because one guy that did a very small thing in his mind to just go, let's give Jim a shot. Think about that who I'm going to marry, the standard, the esteem of the word of God, and the ministry to be called to. And I'm here today because people looked at me and they made big and small disciples in big and small ways. It'd be so fun to go around the room and go tell your, tell your story. 
where somebody stepped in to your life and did just a little thing at the time, completely changed the course of your life. That's what Christians do. Let's pray. God, thank you for the people that you've put uh, in my life to shape me. And I thank you on behalf of my brothers and sisters here for the, the people that have come alongside them at various times. Maybe it was struggling and hurting, and maybe it felt like it. Maybe it was a big thing. They knew it was a big thing. But I'm grateful, especially today, for all the small ways that people have rallied around and gathered around people to help them grow in their relationship with your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray today you would empower us by the power of your Holy Spirit to go be the small voice, to be willing to do the small thing and see what you do it what you do with it, the fruit that it bears. Father, help us be faithful to you to make big and small disciples in big and small ways. In Christ's name, amen. As you come forward today, it might be good to be thinking about this. As you are going where, where would you go to bring this gospel message of Christ and what he's done, that he, he went all the way to the cross to give his body, to pour out his blood for you, for me, that we can have life in him. Who are the people that you're going to see today, tomorrow, this week that need that message? And as you come forward today, would you be refreshed and reminded of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us? Amen. I'll invite our communion servers forward. hard to believe I have faith that you will do greater things it's my time to go but before I leave go tell the world about me I was dead but now before you leave so go tell the world about me I was dead but now I live I've gotta go now for a little while but goodbye is not the end the end of the road my spirit is with you wherever you go you have a purpose and I have a plan I'll make you this promise I'll come back again unto
God so loved the world that he gave his son and then he left his church here to tell people about the goodness of his son. That's our job is making disciples of Jesus Christ. And we want to, as a church, we want to come alongside and equip you even more so to do that. So you heard the fire hose of stuff that I told you about. Um, but at the end of the day, just cut one thing, reach out to us and we are glad to help you take a step in becoming a more fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. We'll have next week, we've got baptisms. We have really, really spectacular Sunday praising God together. And then we're going to start a series this fall, uh, Sermon on the Mount. We're going to look at Matthew 5 through 7 and see this great sermon given by Jesus, what it meant then, what it means for us today. But what we have before us today is as you leave, you can see on those signs, go make disciples of all nations. Would you, by the power of the Holy Spirit in you, go from this place and as you are going, 
to make disciples of the people that you come in contact with for their good and for the glory of God. Amen. Have a great day.